Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure, really, to be with you to worship our great God, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, here on this Sunday. And it is Sunday, and Sunday is the day for many centuries when believers will gather, and when we gather today here in Schuylkill Haven to remember the empty tomb and remember the one who conquered death. Now, it is interesting to me that you would invite a North Schuylkill Spartan down to, uh, to speak with you, but uh, I'm glad for that, even though we're rivals in sports. Uh, oh, Pine Grove Car and some Blue Mountain Eagles, I'm sure. We have a few Blue Mountain Eagles in here as well. Yeah, yeah we're, uh, we're all on the same team with the Lord, of course, and uh, I did want to say before I start, though, I, I had an opportunity to listen to Pastor Ted's June messages, and what a blessing that was to be able to listen uh, to the sermons online, and you're blessed to have him here. He seems like a, a wonderful man of God, and I, I'm sure that you are praying for him and supporting him and encouraging him. So, uh, but as I listened to his message, what I wanted to tell you was that uh, I, I was listening with sort of an ear to the Spirit of God. It's like, okay, God, what are you, what are you doing in Haven in June? And uh, I had noted how Pastor Ted gave you that message from Psalm 1. If you recall back a few weeks, Psalm 1, there were two paths, the right path and the wrong path. And then your pastor went on to talk about Psalm 19, and we were glad for the guides that we have along the path that help us on our way. And I even listened last week on Father's Day and was able to enjoy and, and be blessed by his message from Proverbs 22, verse 6, that if we train up a child in the way he should go or she should go, that that instruction and discipline in the Lord will stay with them throughout life as they go through many twists and turns. So in the spirit of, of what God has been doing here this past month, I thought I'd just try to follow up on some of those thoughts. So the message today, you may, as you hear it, you may note some parallels, especially to Psalm 1. If you remember that passage, the, the two paths, you'll see some parallels there. Um, but the message is called, Who's Your Daddy? And that's an expression that uh, during the first service here, the traditional service, there weren't as many young people, so I had to explain what that meant. But I'm guessing most of you probably understand what that is. So when you're playing one-on-one -on -one basketball and you soar up above your opponent with the ball in your hand, Vince, you've done this. <laughs> yeah. Slam that down, you dunk that ball. You come down and you growl, who's your daddy? Or maybe a better example these days would be this one, Schuylkill Haven Hurricane baseball team. How about it? Yeah. They can say to the whole state, imagine that. Hey, Pennsylvania, who's your daddy? That's wonderful, and I'm thrilled that you guys had accomplished that. But what we'll see in today's passage is a, a back and forth between Jesus and the Pharisees. So I'd, I'd like to call your attention to the Gospel of John, and Jesus is going to ask the Pharisees at some point, who's your daddy? So you can look for that. We'll be reading from John chapter 8, and we'll set the context in verse 31, but the message itself, I'll pick up the context in verse 37. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we will be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, 
everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we ask that you'll be with us now. We ask that you would open our minds to the truth in your word. But more importantly, Lord, we ask that you'd open our hearts, that you'd speak to us as your individual sons and daughters, Open our hearts, Lord, to the message you have for us today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we start in the text, just by way of a little background, I thought we'd discuss some New Testament politics. These are some groups that were in the community, in the, in the nation of Israel at that time. And it, it helps us to learn who these groups are because in our passage today, Jesus is talking to the last group, the Pharisees there. So let's just take a minute and go into some history here a little bit. Back when Jesus was in the flesh on the planet, the Roman Empire was controlling the entire Middle East. They had conquered, really, the, the whole area of the world at that time. And they were an oppressive government. So the nation of Israel was a conquered land, and they were under the control of the Roman Empire. Now you might recall in the Gospels, when Jesus dies on the cross, you remember the guy named Pontius Pilate. He was the governor. He was there on the authority and the power of Rome, and he was the one who could put Jesus to death because the, the Roman Empire kept the power of capital punishment for themselves. They decided who lives. They decided who dies. They decided the amount of taxes, and so on. So we keep in mind that the whole New Testament was written during a time when the Roman Empire was in control. Now, also in Israel at that time, there were a group called the Sanhedrin. You may remember reading about them at different points in the Bible. And this is an ancient group of people, actually predates Jesus by many centuries. In the Jewish country that we now know as Israel, they had councils that were set up, and these councils were judges and each of these councils was called a Sanhedrin. So it's kind of like us going to Pottsville. If we have a small claims, we have to go to small claims court. We'd go up there on the hill in Pottsville, and we'd go to the courthouse. That's what the Sanhedrin was. It was a place where you could go 
and you could settle the small issues. And the Roman Empire was happy to have that because honestly, they didn't want to get involved in all the little turmoils of, of daily life. They were happy to allow the Israelite people to judge the small matters for themselves. So that would be the Sanhedrin. The scribes, they were the educated ones. They could read and write, and there weren't that many of them. Imagine that. We'd all be scribes today, right? We can all read and write. We'd all fit this category. But back in the days of scrolls, and uh, they didn't have a, a whole lot of education and learning. And actually, most of recorded history is like that, isn't it? We don't have to go all the way back to the time of Jesus to find that. But we can go back to when there wasn't even a printing press and there were only a handful of people who were educated enough to read and write. So these would be the scribes, and we often encounter them when Jesus is talking in, in the Gospels. Now, not today. It doesn't say he's talking to the scribes today, but they're often in the Gospel stories. And then we have these last two groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Do you guys still sing that song in children's church, I don't want to be a Sadducee, because they are so sad, you see? I don't want to be a Sadducee. I just want to be a sheep. Ba, 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 ba. No. You don't remember that one? Okay. Sorry I, me I mentioned it. <laughs> but uh, the Sadducees, they were a political party, and, and they were not very well loved in Israel. And it, it's obvious why. When you, when you hear what, what they're all about, you'll understand why. They, first of all, they're, they're filthy rich. They were the well-off financial people within the culture. And not only were they really rich, but they were really compromisers. See, they kept all the riches by cozying up to Rome. You know, we've got to be buddy-buddy with the Caesar, right? With the governor. Got to keep in his good graces here, because otherwise he's going to take all my stuff, and I won't be able to drive a Lamborghini or whatever. I guess they didn't call them Lamborghinis, but whatever the fancy chariots of the day were. So the Sadducees in that culture, and we do see Jesus interacting with the Sadducees a lot of times, and we'll see them in the trial, with the, the bogus trial, when they condemn Jesus, we'll see them as well there. But what we have today is this last group, the Pharisees. And these Pharisees, they were very religious. You could even say they were religious zealots. They were, first of all, they were from the common people. They were from the middle class, or in some cases from the lower class. So the Jewish culture, they could relate to the Pharisees. They admired the Pharisees, hated the Sadducees. We don't want the Sadducees, but they admired the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, they loved the law. These people loved the first five books of the Bible that we still study Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Pharisees, they tried their absolute best to listen to everything that was written in the law of Moses, those first five books. And they also added on a whole bunch of other rules too. So they really tried hard to follow. They were strict observers of the religious law in Israel. So when we see Jesus having this discussion with them, it's tempting for us who have the New Testament to say, oh, here they are again, right? Here are the Pharisees. Here are those bunch of yo-hos, those bad guys who are always giving the Lord a hard time. But I'd suggest to you that they're not all bad. In fact, of all the groups listed above on the screen, if there's any here that are likely to listen to the message of Jesus... I would suggest to you that the most likely to listen would be the Pharisees. In fact, in Scripture, we have some examples of some Pharisees who became believers. Do you remember Nicodemus in the Gospel of John, chapter 3? He was a Pharisee, and he came to see Jesus at night, and he asked Jesus, Who are you? What's going on? And Jesus said that classic line that you must be born again. He told that to Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. And we know that Nicodemus was a believer. You might say, well, how do you know? How do you know he was a believer? Here's how we know. When Jesus died on the cross, two very well-connected people went to Pilate and asked for the body, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. He went and said, 
Can we take the body of Jesus off the cross and bury it? And Nicodemus shows up. The Gospel of John tells us um, in chapter 19, verse 39, when Nicodemus shows up and it takes the body of our Savior off the cross, he didn't show up empty-handed. Nicodemus brought 100 pounds of spices. That's a fortune. He spent a fortune anointing the body of Jesus. And he brought his linens to wrap the body. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee. We also know the Apostle Paul. We love the Apostle Paul. Don't we love that guy? He wrote all those letters. What was he before he was an apostle? Pharisee. He was a Pharisee, the Bible tells us. He was known as the name Saul at that time. And here's a verse. Here's one that I didn't know. I've read Acts of the Apostles, as you have as well, and I had missed this all these years. In Acts chapter 15, verse 5, the context there is the believers were meeting in Jerusalem and they were trying to solve an early crisis in the church. And the crisis was that there were a lot of Jewish believers and a lot of Gentile believers, and they had two radically different cultures. So how are we going to blend them together? And they had to make some decisions. And as they were making those decisions, there's a verse that jumped out at me in the context of what we're looking at today. And that's verse 5. It says, some of the Pharisees who had believed stood up to talk. When you're reading that context, you just sort of brush right by that, right? Like, what's going to happen? Is it gonna be, are they going to have to get circumcised or not? Are they going to be more Jewish or are they going to be more Gentile? So our brains in that context are always thinking about how's that counsel going to end? But I'll read that verse again to you in verse 5 of Acts 15. It said, some of the Pharisees who had believed stood up to talk. Ooh, where did these guys come from? Some of the Pharisees who had believed. Maybe they came from the message we're going to look at today. Maybe they were there when Jesus was telling him this message about the two fathers. Maybe they were there when Jesus asked, who's your daddy? And maybe some of these guys went home and said, who is my daddy? Am I following God or am I following another daddy? So let's look. I call your attention to verses 37 and 38, where Jesus introduces this idea of two different fathers. Jesus says to them, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. In effect, Jesus is saying, who's your daddy? There's two fathers here. And, and the Pharisees who are listening, they're, they're smart. They study the Bible. They, they study the law. They know right away that Jesus is, is taking a shot at them here. We know they know it right away because look how they respond. They answer and say to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus goes on to say, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. What they're saying here is, wait a minute, Jesus. Don't say that we have the wrong dad. They're saying, hold on there, carpenter's son. Our lineage goes back to Abraham. We're God's homies. We're all right with God. We're in good with God. Do you remember the movie from the 70s, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Some of you remember that one? I got the golden ticket. They had the golden ticket. How can they have some other father? I can't have another father. What are you talking about? We're Abraham's descendants. And we know, we as Christians, we've studied the same texts that they studied. We know what God said to Abraham. Back in Genesis chapter 12, God said, Abraham, go forth from your country and I will bless you. And God promised him, made a covenant with him, said, I will make you a great nation. And God wasn't done promising because Abraham had a son named Isaac. 
And God reiterated the promise to Isaac. He said, Isaac, you're Abraham's son. I will bless you. I will make of you a great nation. And then Abraham had his own son, Jacob. And God made a covenant with him. In fact, God even changed Jacob's name. Do you remember that part of Genesis? God said, I give you a new name, Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob. You shall be called Israel. That's where the name Israel comes from, was given to Jacob. And then God blessed Jacob with 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. And all the Jewish people of all history can trace their ancestry right back to that one guy, Abraham. So when they're talking, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here, and Jesus brings up the idea of two different dads, they say, wait a minute, not us. We only have one lineage. We go back to Abraham. Now, it sounds like a quaint idea, doesn't it, that you can somehow be okay with God because you go back lineage-wise to Abraham. But as I was thinking about that idea, I realized that we Americans, we have some of this in us too. I think we do. I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know I'm free, right? We're glad, and it's okay. That's good. It's good to be proud of our heritage, and we should be. But when it comes to salvation and when it comes to who's our spiritual dad, Jesus is telling the Pharisees, and he's telling us too, he said, being born into it's not good enough. You know, just because you believe your parents were believers who took you to church, that's not good enough. You're going to have to make your own decision. Everybody who comes into the kingdom comes in as an individual. It's a narrow path. It's like a turnstile. You can't bring the whole gang in. You can't bring the whole family in. You can't bring the whole nation in. You know, you have to go in individually. So Jesus has to deal with this idea first, this idea that they are Abraham's descendants, and Jesus is about to tell them in the next verse that that's not going to be good enough. And this is the point of conflict. Jesus tells them, you are doing the deeds of your father. And they're offended, the Pharisees. They're offended. They said to him, we were not born as a result of fornication. We have one father, God. They don't like it that Jesus is asking, who's your daddy? To give you a metaphor... If you think of a boxing match, you know, the boxing ring, before round one starts, they ring the bell, ding, ding, ding. You have to come out punching, right? Hey, the Pharisees, they're up for it. They're up for the fight. They heard the bell. Jesus rang the bell. Ding, ding, ding. He says, you're not like my father. <laughs> he said, I listen to my father. You listen to your father. They know it's a fight. So they come out and they're throwing them. They say, we have one daddy and it's God. God is our daddy. God is our father. They come out swinging. They're saying, let's go. But Jesus answers in verse 42. And I think this is the most beautiful part of our text today. I hope you do as well. And it does reflect back to Pastor Ted's sermon on Psalm 1. You know, the two paths. If you're on the right path, this verse should speak to your heart. And I, I trust that it will. When they say, we're okay with God, Abraham's our dad, we're good, the only, God, the only father we have is God, Jesus says, if God were your father, you would love me. If God were your father, you would love me. And let's apply those to our hearts today, here in June 2021. Can't we hear that? I can hear that in my spirit. I can hear those words. I can hear Jesus saying to me, maybe you can to you. He's saying to me, yo, John, God, your father, you will love me. And it reminds us of a, a time when Jesus was talking to Peter. And perhaps some of you have even thought of this passage as, as I've been speaking here at the end of John's gospel. In John 21, I'd like to read a few verses to you, verses 15 through 17. Remember, Jesus had risen from the dead, 
and he was showing up and he was talking to the disciples. And at one point he showed up on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and they were out there fishing and they had a little breakfast together. They had some fish on the fire. And as they were having breakfast together, it says in John 21 verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Brothers and sisters in Schuylkill Haven today, I would suggest to you that Jesus is asking us the same question that he asked Peter. That he's asking us, do you love me? We say God is our father and God is our father. So Jesus wants to know, do we love him? And we're kind of like Peter in that passage. I know I'm like Peter. It's like, come on, Lord. You know my heart. You know all things. You know I love you. That's what Peter was saying to Jesus. You know the answer, Lord. And we often, and rightly so, we recall that Peter had denied Christ three times, didn't he? Three times he said he didn't even know Christ. So Jesus gives Peter the chance to be redeemed or restored. Those of you who are parents, you know when your, your child does wrong and you have to discipline and correct your child? Sometimes it's important to give your child restoration where redemption, you know, mommy still loves you or daddy still loves you. And, and we restore our child and let our child know that, yeah, you screwed up and you might have to be punished, but you didn't lose the family connection. So Jesus, in a way, is doing that for Peter, He's saying, yes, you denied me three times, but I'm giving you an opportunity to be redeemed from that, to accept me three times. But there's even something deeper in the heart of Jesus here. And maybe your spirit can pick up on it, and my spirit can pick up on it, when Jesus says, if God is your father, you will love me. Well, here comes the knockout in our boxing match in verse 44. Jesus absolutely, very directly, looks into their eyes. The text doesn't say he looks into their eyes, but I'm sure he did. And he had to say the harsh truth to those Pharisees that day. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. Could you imagine you are of your father, the devil? It's almost, if you'll, if you'll accept this, I, I think there's a, almost humor here. It's not quite humor because it's so serious, but it's... it's in a dark sense, humorous when Jesus just, bam, here's who your daddy is. He says, I'm going to tell you now, it's not Abraham like you claim, and it's not God like you claim. He says, your father is the devil. The Greek word there is diabolos, which means the slanderer, the one who slanders, the one who tells lies. The original liar was the devil, the diabolos, the slanderer, the liar, and that's who your daddy is. Now, we know in the Bible that this being who is the devil started out as an angel. In the prophet Isaiah in chapter 14, we can read about his fall. I won't turn there today, but you might recall it. 
In the beginning, this being was created as a glorious, bright angel. In fact, in Isaiah, he's given the name Lucifer. And that name Lucifer literally means son of the morning or son of the dawn. And it refers to a star, the morning star that we in Western civilization were scientists now, right? You might re recall learning that that morning star is actually the planet Venus. You know, that bright star that shows up in the early morning and in, in the early evening is actually the planet Venus. Well, they hadn't arrived at that that's the planet Venus yet, so they just knew it as the morning star. And that's the name that was given this angel, Lucifer. He was the morning star. He was bright. He was glorious. He had the blessing, the brilliance, and yet he fell. And we won't get into the whole fall thing. But the father of the Pharisees, the father of liars, the father of murderers is the first being who committed lies. It's the first being who committed murders. And it's this angel, it's this guy Lucifer, who is sometimes called the devil, the slanderer. He is also called by our Lord Jesus by the name Satan. The word Satan in the Greek language means adversary or enemy. It would be a judicial term. So again, I take you to the courthouse in Pottsville. We're in small claims court and we're the defendant. There's going to be a prosecuting attorney. That attorney is the Satan in Greek. That is the adversary. That is the enemy. That is the one who will prosecute us. So the word Satan was not a proper noun. It was not a name. It was just a title of an enemy or an adversary. So we have this being, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, he's a liar, he's a murderer. Jesus, unfortunately, has to share the harsh truth with these people that they are doing the deeds of Satan. Now, in closing, just really the last couple slides here, the family resemblance, let's take a minute and consider this. How do we know? How do we know? How do I know which daddy is mine? Because so often I have one foot in the right place and one foot in the wrong place. Often I find myself not characterized by the good things, but falling short or stepping over the line. So how do we know? Well, there's going to be a family resemblance, and I'd like to read to you those things. These come from the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians. And I'll just mention them briefly to you today. We'll start out with the family resemblance of the Pharisees that day who had their father who was the devil. What does that look like? Here's what it says. Paul writing in Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 19, he said, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. Here they come. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Then he writes this, very important part. He says, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you previously, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Ooh, what are you saying here? Lord, what are you saying here? Here's what he's saying. He's saying, we as believers, we can commit any of the sins on that list. And let's be honest, haven't we? Haven't we committed those sins? I know I have. I won't speak for all of you. I won't throw all of you under the bus. But you can find in my life... Times, you certainly can find outbursts of anger. You can ask my wife. She's not here today. She could verify. When I'm driving down the road in my car, if somebody pulls out in front of me, I always don't think, oh, bless you, Lord. <laughs> bless them. Help them, Lord. Sometimes, you know, the steering wheel gets to, what an idiot. <laughs> an outburst of anger, right? I mean, we fall. We fall short. I fall short. I step over the line. I, I 
often step over the line. Many of those sins. How about the dissensions, disputes, and factions? Can you relate to that? I won't ask who's on the board here <laughs> at the church, but I know I've served on the boards at my local church, and uh, I've been guilty. I won't point fingers at somebody else. And I'll say it's been me sometimes where I want to have my own way on something. And I'm, I'm just too much into the dispute and the dissension part of it. So, yes, we as believers, we do these things. And the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross covers these things for us. Thank you, Lord. But Paul says that those who practice those things, that's the Pharisees. That's Satan. Isn't Satan the practicer of lies? Isn't he the father of lies? He says that family resemblance, if, if, we ha if that characterizes us, if that's who we are, that, that list, we're not on the right road in Psalm chapter 1, Psalm 1. We're not on the right road if that's what characterizes us. Because that's what Jesus is telling the Pharisees. He's saying that's the family resemblance of the devil. But let's look at the good family from the Spirit and see what that resemblance looks at. In verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5, Paul says, here's the fruit of the Spirit, and this is what will characterize us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And those are the virtues that are created in us through the Holy Spirit of God when we yield ourselves to God. Those are the things. That's the family resemblance. As Jesus said, if God's your father, these are the things that will become your practice more and more as you go through life. These are the things that will start to characterize you. Not 100%, not perfectly, but these are the things that we should note not lying, not murdering, those are the other daddy. In closing, just the last two slides. Jesus said this, and this is a, a verse worth meditating on, I think. He who is of God hears the words of God. Hey, that's you today. You wouldn't be here, right? You're li what are you listening to today? We're listening to John chapter 8. We're listening to the Word of God. So you're literally one who's hearing the words of God today. And so am I. We're hearing the words of God. That's a good thing. Because that's evidence that our Father is not Satan. Because those whose Father are Satan, they're not going to be here right now. We might be able to pull them in. We pray that we will, that we'll be able to pull them out of the fire, right? Pull them out of that. But when that's your father, you're characterized by a different lifestyle. You're not going to listen to the word of God. And sadly, and you know this, you don't need some North Schuylkill Spartan to come in and tell you this because you already know this. Our culture is, here's a battleground right now. They're saying you can't believe this stuff. Soon, very soon, this is going to be condemned as hate literature. You're not going to be able to find this on Twitter or on Facebook, sadly. But that's always the way it's been because the other father, the other kingdom is always going to battle against this. They wanted Jesus dead, those Pharisees that we're looking at in today's text. They killed them because they're murderers and liars. Someday, maybe soon, it's in the Lord's knowledge. We don't know. But someday we might be given a choice where they say, hey, you deny this book. You better start denying that because it's hate literature. And when the culture does that, we we'll want to remember what's up on the screen right now in verse 47. We're not going to deny it. He or she who is of God will hear the words of God, will follow the words of God. Or another way of saying it, and this is the last slide today. The very words of Jesus, if God were your father, you would love me. Yes, Jesus, we want that. We want to love you. And you might ask, well, how do you do that? How do, how do you show love for Jesus? It's not hard. 
Vince, how do you show love for Jill? Yeah. It's not hard showing somebody you love them. You do things to make them happy or her happy, right? Lots of things, Vince. <laughs> but we do. I mean, we know what love is. You know what love is. So when Jesus says to Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? When he says to us today, he says, John, do you love me? And something in our heart right now as I'm saying it, as you're sitting here and your heart is crying out, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Well, Jesus is going to tell us something. He told Peter to tend his sheep. What's he telling me? What's he telling you? Part of what I hear is he's telling me to get one foot out of the world. He's saying, get that foot out of the world, John. He's saying, stop playing around over there with the other father's characteristics. He's saying, get out of that stuff. Don't go there. Come here, right? Come here. Don't go where the other father's activity is prevalent. That's one of the things I hear him say. And even as he said to Peter, tend my sheep. Some of you worked at VBS this week. That's awesome. What were you doing? You were literally tending his sheep. What a great opportunity that was to serve others. And if you didn't work at VBS, I haven't worked at VBS in a while, but I still get opportunities and so do you. I would suggest to you that even today, when we leave here today, this very day, I bet you don't get one hour out of this church service till you're given an opportunity to show your love for Jesus in one of those fruits of the Spirit. Patience, peace, kindness. Do you expect an opportunity today to show kindness to somebody? Expect it. It's there. Look for it. And when you do it, here, here's the tricky part. Jesus said, don't let the left hand know what the right hand's doing, right? Whenever that happens, what I sometimes make a mistake of, and perhaps you do too, I kind of pat myself on the back, say, oh, good job, John, yeah. You held that door open for that person. Yeah, good job. He's saying, don't do that. He said, let it go right away. If, if you have to think anything, just think, thank you, Jesus, I didn't miss that one, right? Like, the 15 people before that I slammed the door on. <laughs> I didn't miss that one. So let's look for it. Let's, you and I together and all of us together, let's look for it today because in effect, what we're saying to God is, yes, God, you are our Father and we do love you. And because we love you, we do hear your word. And because we hear your word, we will do what your word says. We will set that as our practice. And even though we do it imperfectly, we will keep getting up. Proverbs says, a just person falls seven times and rises up again. The number seven is the number of perfection or completion. It's saying you mess up all the time. You can fall seven times. You can mess up all the time. You can fall into the same sin constantly, 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 constantly. But the difference is you're still not practicing it. You're still fighting it. You're going to rise up, brush the sin off, ask the Lord's forgiveness, and go on from there. So let's pray together, and we'll ask the Lord to help us do just this. Oh, Lord, we do ask. We do not want to be children of Satan. We do not want to miss the kingdom that you have promised that you will be bringing soon, Lord. We don't want to miss it, and we want to show you that we love you. So help us, help each one of us, Lord, to love you better, to love you more directly, more purely. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Give us the strength and the courage to do the right things. And we acknowledge you as our Father. We rejoice that you're our Daddy. So be with each one of us, Lord. Give us renewed strength and energy. We look forward to the day that you return. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come back soon. And may you find loving hearts. And may our hearts be among those loving hearts. We pray in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, John, for that.
very important and informative message. Greatly appreciate it.